Hey. So Hello. I guess. <laughs> okay. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining us for the kickoff of our second season today with an amazing guest, Jer Tour. But before, just some words for the ones that are here for the first time. Uh, so we are a group of DataViz enthusiasts with a goal to promote a DataViz community in Portugal, bringing together everyone that wants to transform raw data into expressive and effective visualizations. So without further ado, Salome, we'll introduce you the, our guest for today. Of course. Uh, Ger Thorpe is a Canadian living in New York City, and he is best known for designing the algorithm to place the nearly 3,000 names on the 9-11 memorial in Manhattan. Ger was also the New York Times first data artist in residence, is a National Geographic Explorer, and in 2017 and 18, served as the innovator in residence at the Library of Congress. Besides being one of the world's foremost data artists, Jer is also a leading voice for the ethical use of big data. His book, Living in Data, not only redefines what data is, but reimagines how it might be truly public, inclusive, and human. Timely and inspiring, this book gives us a path forward, one where it's up to all of us to imagine a more just and participatory data democracy. So you're Thank introduced. You. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. It's that's lovely. It's lovely to be here. You know, I, um, here is such a weird word to use because we all have our all of our different here's. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, I'm actually just under the Manhattan Bridge on the Brooklyn side. Um, I usually like to start any conversation by acknowledging that where I am right now is the ancestral uh, land of the Munsi Lenape and the Canarsie people. Before the city existed, and it's just always a nice acknowledgement. If you go to nativeland.ca, it does a pretty good job of um, native-land.ca. It's a pretty good, excellent visualization interface that will teach you a little bit about the histories of the place that you're living on right now. Great, that's that's lovely. Should should we start with the questions? Yeah, let's I, let's start. Let's I, do but it. I was because <laughs> I wanted to get in the mood. One of the one of the hard parts of of saying yes to these events is that I, I, of course, I'm excited to talk to you, all of you, but I'm really upset that I'm not in Lisbon because it's one of my favorite yes. cities. And so I tried to um, gather some atmosphere. I'm drinking some Portuguese wine and I have oh. uh, <laughs> some sardines and some bread. And, and so I, I'm going to be eating during this. So it, like if I, I have like, it's, it's kind of an excuse as well to think about the questions. So if you ask me a really hard question, I'm going to like eat a whole sardine. Hmm, let me see. <laughs> yeah. Super nice, super nice. Yeah, I hope this will be just the first uh, version of what it, what can be a next event in Lisbon. Uh, for sure, we'll be invited if we organize. Thanks. Yeah, so, the last time I was there, I was sure. with uh, with Manuel Lima uh, oh, to, wow. to an event, and, uh, and yeah. it was it was very nice. It was a good event. Um, but the best part was afterwards he took us to this tiny little neighborhood bar and we just ate and ate and ate and ate and like <laughs> drank and drank, food, and drank yeah. and drank. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. That's, That's the cool. best part of Lisbon yeah. is the food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one the one the of people, the best. The people the and then the food. Yeah, yeah. And Manuel Lima is now here in Lisbon, I, I guess. So now you have it. Yeah. To who it will oh, well, be a go. nice. Uh, well, you have a better chance of seeing it before I have then. So say hi to him. Probably. <laughs> Okay, so let's dive into the questions. Sure. So, sure. May, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, um, what got you to write the book, and how would you describe it if you were talking to a five-year-old? <laughs> I have a six-year-old who was five. Oh, um, he was five two months ago, so I have some experience uh, in, <laughs> in in talking to 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 kids of that age. Well, you know, the, maybe the first thing that I would say to to my son is that. Sometimes when you have um, questions in your head or problems that you can't think your way around, that one of the best ways to get through that is to write. And so for me, the reason why I wrote this book is that as a data practitioner, I started with data visualization in about 2009 and had done a lot of um, computational work uh, for the decade before that. Um, you know, over over the years that I was working with data, I just 
there was these questions that kind of burrowed their way into my head that I that I found I couldn't really exercise. I couldn't get them out. Uh, and I would try. I taught I taught classes about this stuff, and I um, and I would give presentations. And each one of those things was like a way to loosen those things and kind of get them a little clearer. But writing the book was was a chance for me to really sit down um, with some questions that I had about my own practice, and questions that I have about data practices in general, and then really to face uh, head on this really, um, what, what I found to be a really tough truth, which was that our last two decades, if we call it that, of building things with data has not gone well. We, we, we have not like made the world a better place in the way that I think a lot of us hoped that we would have. And so the, the book was, was to try to figure out how it happened that we got in this, this place where, um, where to live in data is, is not a pleasant thing and how we might start to imagine better, better ways. So, um, it really felt necessary for me to write this. And I, I'd been trying for about a decade to sit down and write it. And then um, I think we have a tendency in this country to blame a lot of things on on Donald Trump. But when, when Donald Trump was elected, I was like, okay, I got to write this book. Uh, and and, and it, it, maybe a couple of months later, I, um, I woke up one morning at about 5 a.m. and I sat at my bar, which is just over here. And I, I, I had a cup of tea and I wrote what ended up being most of the first chapter of the book. Okay. okay. So, so um, in your book, while you were um, you are explaining your process in one of your projects, at some point you refer to data visualization as a lossy kind of alchemy. <laughs> Can you explain a bit uh, what do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, That's right. a beautiful uh, way to Thanks. put it. Yeah, so that you know that phrase, we we as data visualizers are um, you know, to, to borrow a little bit of phrasing from Lab Manovich, we're 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 doing in one kind of another, we're doing a mapping between something that typically is not visible into something that is visible. And so it is this alchemical thing where we're changing, we're changing one thing into another. And in our minds, you know, to to take that even further, I think um we almost, we do ascribe a kind of value to that. Like we we are at least believing we're we're, we're turning this this spreadsheet into some type of gold, right? This like understandable thing that people could now glean information from. But it's necessary in that type of act that things are lost, and we are the ones as visualizers, or you know, I, I call, I mean, we may use the term data. You know, we're we're people who tell data or tell tell data stories, um, we we make decisions in every one of those points when when we're filtering the data, when we're writing our code, when we're choosing our colors, when we're choosing our shapes, when we're choosing our typefaces, every one of those decisions, we lose something. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're honest with that, it becomes a little bit easier because you, you, there's no way for us to 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 represent a kind of complete truth, and we need to drop things as we move forward, and um, and so the act itself is is one of this is definitely not a five year old word, but it's ex excision, right? We're we're trimming, we're 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 using our kind of sharp blade of code, and we're. <laughs> We're trimming something into a form but that that it's which is its final thing, and I think there's a way. To, there's an easy way to convince ourselves that if we follow the right rules and do the process again, we'll end up at the same place. But I think anyone who's ever made something like this knows that's not the case. You make so many iterations and decisions along the way that even if you were able to rewind the tape and get yourself back to where you started and start again, you're going to end up somewhere different. And and so so to me that's um it's beautiful it's a beautiful thing it it makes this process 
unique. It, it, you know, we're, we couldn't, you can't, you could train a, a, an, an algorithm to kind of make data visualizations, but we know what those look like. They look like, and I don't mean this in a dismissive way, but they look like a Tableau dashboard or something like that. <laughs> but the ones that we as a data visualization community really fall in love with are not those ones. No one, no one's ever like, oh man, I really love that, you know, that clean, clean and well labeled bar chart. The ones we love are the ones that that make choices that we didn't expect. And and still manage to do that in a way that the thing that is maintained, that kind of piece of gold at the end, feels true to the uh, to the the thing that we started with. And um, I I've always loved that process, and and I, I would I would like it if we were a little more honest with ourselves about the fact that there is a lot of human choice and a lot of chance going into the ways that we visualize these things. Yeah, it's a very poetic way to describe it, but uh, I honestly, I love it. Uh, you said in your book, and you've said like, a couple of minutes ago, that living in data is mostly terrible. <laughs> yeah. In your own words, to be yeah. lost or bewildered, marginalized or harmed. But do we really have a choice nowadays whether you we live in data anymore yeah well i mean no we don't have a choice we we, we passed that uh, uh a long long time ago um because there's there are no permissions necessary to collect data from somebody in most cases and so all of us you know i this is where the title arrives, is that I used to think about data as something that you might put on a table, right? It's like, oh, shake out shake out a bucket and out, out comes the data. But I realized that that thing on the table is only, only necessarily part of a whole bunch of machinery, right? So in order to get something valuable out of that data, there are uh, computational structures involved. And, and there are companies built around those things. So, so even a small piece of data, there are all these other things that end up surrounding us. Um, and the other reason why, why I say we live in data rather than data as something on a table is that is, is, is that sort of exactly what you're saying is that I, I, I'm not allowed to avoid it. So, so if data were something that I could place on a table, then I could simply walk around it if I didn't want to be engaged with it. But when you live in something, you live in Portugal and I live in America, we, we could get in the airport and leave. But but we in our day to day lives, we we live inside of this thing and everything we do as a human in, in the country you live in, that those structures, those political structures, the geographic structures, they affect the ways you go about your life. And that's the same thing with the data right now. Everything we do right now the ways we want to go about our lives every single one of them is affected in some way by these structures of data that we built around ourselves and so to to consider to still consider it as something that lives in a bucket or on a table doesn't let us think about it the way that we need to think about it and so if we say hey the same way we live in a democracy or the same way we live in a capitalist society or the same way we live you know to choose one of those types of structures we now live in data it gets us to ask questions like, okay, so I live in data. What does that feel like is a good question. What does it feel like to live in data? Um, what, do I, what are my rights as someone who lives in data? What are, my, um, what are my responsibilities as somebody who lives in data? And then at the center of the book, I think, is a question which is, what, what, might, what might being a citizen of data look like? Like, what, what does it mean to, to, to be a citizen? And what that that sort of bundles up all those things, rights and responsibilities, and the kind of um, the the sort of humane conditions we expect out of all the other parts of our lives. Okay, what does it feel like to you to live in data, or are you used to it? For me, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a white man who lives in America, so living in data is not too bad for me. It's not. You know, it's not terrible, but on the other hand, it is. Um, it feels very invasive. You know, to 
to have decisions being made about me that are done completely without my my um without any of my input uh you know i i uh it's become so maybe about five years ago the general public i think got really alarmed about the fact that your web browser was following you everywhere and so we all dutifully installed web blockers and we thought like, okay, that problem is over. But of course it isn't. That's, that same technology is being used, but in less blunt ways. So, you know, I live in a, in a, in a country of privatized healthcare. Like God, I, I don't know how I ended up here as a Canadian. Um, and we know like insurance decisions are being made based on the same types of algorithmic um, systems that used to recommend you, you know, flashlights and watches or whatever it was in your web browser. And so even now those are things we have less visibility on. So I, I don't know anymore that that the algorithm thinks that I'm really into motorcycles, but my insurance company knows that and they will adjust my insurance premiums related like related to that yeah. knowledge that they know. Yeah. So this has not gone away. And you know, as 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 um scholars like Kate Crawford and many other AI researchers have pointed out to us that in fact it's gotten much worse because we are now, instead of feeding these these data through procedural systems, we're now feeding them through machine learning systems. And those two things are very different. You know, and a procedural system is a machine in which I can open and get a look at its parts. Whereas a machine learning system, I can't get a look at its parts. All I can see is what I'm putting in the top and what's coming out the bottom. And so we have this compounding of something which was already dangerous five or six years ago or even 10 years ago that is now dangerous in ways that are harder to see. And then, you know, I started with the, with the description of myself as a, as a white male. And I think we all have to remember that living in data is not a universal thing. And the way that I live in data is different from the way that you live in data. And the way that somebody who is a migrant crossing the border in the South the United States lives in data is completely different than the way that I do. You know, the way that they are being surveilled is much more direct. There's like a drone flying overhead, whereas the way that I'm being surveilled is 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 more subtle. But what we know from history and what I think is really important to keep your eyes on, and we're, we're kind of running along a path here that we, we can swing back, but that um, these technologies are always tested and deployed in those places in conflict zones, against migrants, against the incarcerated. And then later they get deployed against us. And 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 so it's it's really important for us to be to be looking at those things. And then, you know, maybe for me, the, the core of the book is to be starting to ask ourselves, OK, if we don't like this, what do what do we want? Like, what is the, What is the future look like if it were better than it is right now? Um, this this can get a bit bleak when you start to think <laughs> to think <laughs> about these these questions. But I, I'd like to get back to something you said earlier about creativity and about artistic expression and trying to do things differently. How do you think we can encourage creativity in data visualization in a more structured or serious settings or fields of knowledge like? business or academia where things are a bit more strict i'm gonna have a sardine <laughs> sure. more portuguese than us right now we, yeah yeah i uh well you know th this this is a question which i ha have had thought about a lot so i i am I joined, I joined the new york times in 2010 as their data artist in residence and i you know as i write in the book that's a title that i totally made up um, you know, they, they didn't post an ad for a data artist in residence. Um, and, and, and I, so I had this real, real freedom at that place that I, that, that I never really had before in a workspace to, to do whatever we wanted to do. And so we had this ability to be creative. And in the book, I also write about this concept of question farming, which is, which is, you know, a lot of us do data visualization in the service of like question confirming or, or answer confirming. It's like people sort of know an answer and they want to see a visualization that confirms it. Whereas we were really excited about the opposite of that. Um, 
you know, what a statistician might think of as exploratory analysis instead of confirmatory analysis, but what I think of as an artist as um, joy versus satisfaction. Like there's, there's something really satisfying to see the answer you know in the data, but there's something joyous about finding an answer that you didn't know was going to be there. And so I've talked a lot over the years about to teams and companies about how they might sort of foster that type of, 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 of work. And a lot of, you know, what it requires is, is, is some faith from whoever that power above is, because what you need to do is you need to remove that necessity for, um, uh, for like a result that you can you already see you have to have yourselves open for results that you might not not already see and actually michael zimbalist who was the guy the person that ran that um new york times r d group when he was hired that was his his requirement for the lab was that it would have no required business outcome and so so the lab could kind of do what it wanted to do um anyways he said because that's how a research lab exists, and if it doesn't, then it's just a PR group. You know, you're you're, you're doing you're doing things in the service of um, a company. And, you know, as individuals, there there are ways to break yourself out of that and 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 do and be more exploratory. And and I always ask people to to take whatever they they are most attached to in data visualization and go, go out of it. <laughs> so if you're the type of data visualization person who only codes and doesn't draw, well, then maybe you should go and draw. But, but maybe the other ways to break out are a little less tangible. And so I think about time and I think about scale and I think about place. So time, every, uh, every visualization that you probably have ever built is something that ex experienced in a matter of seconds or maybe minutes. So think to yourself, like, how does a visualization get experienced over hours or days or months or years? Like, can we stretch that out in ways that are that are going to break our brains a little bit? And then scale the same idea. You know, most of the work we do is either on a phone or like on a on a on a piece of paper, you know, that like, the size of your laptop screen. So can you break that? Like what make a data visualization on your kitchen wall, you know, Think about something that runs along the sidewalk outside of your house. Uh, those are ways to 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 change the the kind of your brain a little bit. And then the last one is place. There's something safe, I think, about delivering data visualizations that are either in uh, you know newspaper websites or 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 annual reports or or on your blog. It's less safe to have those things delivered, you know, in a public park or or you know, on the side of a wall, or something like that. And so, I love I love the the challenge of bringing data into public spaces. And I think that that is something that I, um, yeah, I, I'm really really excited about. And it feels like a, it feels can feel a little bit indulgent, but I think it's necessary for us as data practitioners to understand how do we bring data to people who are not in our audience. We are very good at talking to each other. We are not that good at talking <laughs> at talking more broadly to other people, and and so um, yeah, that's a big part of the book. Okay, so touching that that point that you made with the the question farming that I really absolutely love. Um, but can we rely on, on the willingness of people to spend time exploring the data by themselves in such a fast-paced world? Like, how can we increase the, the, the likelihood that our solutions will actually be used? Because for us, it's a way that, okay, I developed this super um, uh, exploratory solution. Um, yeah. But then... It, I don't know. It it has to it has to have the a target audience, of course. But still, mm -hmm. can we rely on this? How can we improve this this uh, solution? Sure, sure. And you, Amanda Cox, who's a big hero of mine, gave gave a talk at at the I/O festival where she talked about any attempt that they had ever done for exploratory analysis at the New York Times has always failed because people just don't do it. And and, and, and I think part of that is that we, we're still nesting that exploratoriness like within the technology. And so we make these exploratory websites that involve people like moving their mouse and changing things. The, the ways that I, where I've seen exploration work are, are, are social. 
So um, we built a project in St. Louis called the St. Louis Map Room, where we asked people to come in and author these 10 foot by 10 foot maps of their lived experience in the city. And then they use those maps to to as instruments to explore civic data that we projected very precisely on top of their maps. And so that's exploratory analysis, but it's exploratory analysis that's using that's using tools that are maybe less comfortable for us and more comfortable for the people doing the exploring. And 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 so that that to me feels feels really important that uh and then and I want to I want to also fasten on to something you were saying about attention span here. And I, and I want us to, re, to be reminded that the tools that we use and the, the web that we inhabit was built by advertisers. It was built by advertisers. You know, the, the first web ad was published on October 27th, 1994, by a group of people from Wired magazine. And, 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 and they, there's a, you know, there's a discussion where they said, you know, everyone said we shouldn't put advertising on the web and we just said, fuck it. And we just went ahead and do it. And I'm not lying about this. They went after and they, they drank a whole bunch of Zima and they had a celebration. Um, and ever since that moment, the technology of the web has been tailored towards advertising. And so I would ask ourselves how much of what we believe about persons, people's attention span has less to do with their attention span and more to do with the way that we deliver content. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a chicken and an egg problem that's really hard to disentangle. We can go out and measure how, many, how, how much time someone spends looking on a web page, but remember that this whole thing was built to deliver little tiny snippets of advertisement. So, it, it's it's you know it, it, what you asked me why I wrote this book and part of it was this is that all of the language we use about data and all of the language we use about the web that's was all written by Silicon Valley, so <laughs> so scary. it's scary. hard for us to even get out of that space and understand oh you know what there may be ways to communicate data that don't depend on the affordances of this advertising platform that we all build our work on top of. And that's, that is something that, that, you know, I just, I, I see more and more clearly. It's that we, we, you gotta kind of peel those layers away and then ask yourself those questions again. Fair enough. Fair enough. We have the first, I'm, I'm hearing myself. Yeah, that's something. No. But go ahead, try to go ahead. It's sure. happening. Okay. Now it's fine. Go uh, ahead, go ahead. We have the first question from our audience. Um, Serenity asks, is it even possible to have data privacy in the future? Maybe going the opposite way, everyone becoming transparent or visualized to everyone else could protect uh, people from centralized power. Uh, yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, I should eat a sardine because it's such a good question. Uh, okay. Feel free. <laughs> so I, I want, I want to maybe just try to build um, a little bit of nuance into that question um, because you talk about everyone in here, and, and that's a hard uh, blanket to put on top of people uh, as far as transparency is is concerned. So. We could imagine a world where we just all resign ourselves to the fact that data is open and we, we kind of put that data out outward. But I think there are places where that becomes really complicated. Uh, and the obvious one is, is, is times in which that data puts people at risk. So uh, we know that there are reg regime, many regimes. I, hey, I was just in a country three days ago in which homosexual acts are illegal and are punishable by life in prison. So it may be one thing to say, hey, it's okay for my browser history to go public because again, I am a very safe person in a very safe place. But for people who, who for whom that data being open will put them at risk, that that is a it's an intractable we can't go past that barrier without without sort of belief and understanding that those people will be safe. I want to go a little bit even deeper and more complicated. So one of the last chapters of my book is about a, a group of um, Maori people in 
in in New Zealand who who are involved in a in a project around indigenous data sovereignty, and so the 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 general idea about indigenous data sovereignty is is to say that any data collected about or by indigenous people in places and culturally important things um, must necessarily be sovereign. That is that its use and its distribution and its ownership must necessarily be controlled by those people. And so any discussion about privacy is nuanced. And 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 I think one of our problems has been that we 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 think about solutions that work for some sort of capital E everyone when in reality there are all kinds of different um circles to borrow an old old Google uh abandoned product metaphor uh that that each have their own concerns about privacy and sovereignty and and I'm not sure what the answers to those things are in the book you know I write a little bit about some new advances in in the distributed web and how some of those things might be put into practice and then and then much more broadly I I think about how do we make data systems in which sovereignty or ownership is built into it from the first place so a lot of the discussion has been about like, oh, Facebook has shitloads of our data. How do we gain some control over that? Well, I have news for you. Like Mark Zuckerberg does not care about any of us, right? He is not acting in good faith. He is he is not going to make the decisions that help us. It's not going to happen. And so we need to kind of abandon. Well, I don't think we have to abandon those things. I think there are some some governmental approaches to to trying to enforce things on that scale. Scale, but we need to think about what assistance look like, especially on the community level, in which data is collected and already owned by people before we have to answer those questions. So, you know, for example, we've been working on a platform called FieldKit, which is an environmental sensing project. And so, right now, if you live in New York and you have questions about um, you know, there's this concept called heat island where different parts of the city are much hotter than others. Uh, and and during heat waves, especially, it, it is a real problem um, for elderly people. If you want to understand the kind of heat island of your neighborhood, you kind of have to be lucky. And some university has to come in and install some sensors and kind of do that thing because that's where the, the kind of data power lies. And so we built this um, this tool called Field Kit, which would allow you to do a similar thing. And what we're working on right now is getting those into libraries. So you could go into a public library, get a sensor, <laughs> install it, you know, collect your own data that maybe is owned by you or your building or your neighborhood group, and then be able to come towards the city and say, "Hey, listen, we have this problem. We want we want some help with." And it's not a full answer, and it's not a it's not a, a, a sufficient answer either, but. I think these are the things we need to start to be thinking about. That's an amazing discussion. I I really love these topics, uh, but I will try to move on more towards the data visualization part. Yeah, uh, yeah, so bringing, <laughs> um, so going back a bit to to the data viz. Um, so in two thousand and nineteen, one in one of your talks, you mentioned um, that you lost some faith in visualization because it goes from the data set to the visual representation and you are more interested in going from the data set uh, to how the data was collected yeah do you still think this way or uh, and can we add this step to the data viz pipeline can it be part of it uh yeah first of all and i i, I love data visualization i still love it <laughs> You know, I, um, you know, I see things that are being made every day that that fill me with like some mix of envy, envy and jealousy. And, and, and I, you know, I love I love the work that's being made. And in no way am I saying that this is like a field that that. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. It's all I'm trying to say. Uh, but but yes, it was. So, so this is how data visualization always worked for me. And this might feel true to you and it might not. But. I would be given a data set, and my job was to go forward with that data set. You know, I, I would get the data, and my job was to make it into something that people could kind of understand. What I was never either able, or maybe I didn't understand how to before, was to go backward with the data set to say, okay, who who recorded this data? 
Why did they record it? What methodologies did they use? What is missing in this data set? You know, because, because there is no magical machine that is recording every data, every data in the world, all the data in the world, and we just like turn on a tap and get a piece of it. That's not how it works, right? That the, we're there's a selection process that says, oh, this thing is important enough to be recorded. And so what I started to understand was that that is really a, pro a problem because what can happen as a data visualizer, and this is maybe where my trepidation sit, sat the most, is that it's very easy for us to magnify like existing biases in the data, and and or or to take a narrative that maybe isn't a complete narrative and make it shine, you know, turn it into that nugget of gold, and. As we do, we have power as data visualizers. We we do, we, we know it. And I think sometimes we're a little too self-congratulatory about it. You know, like, oh, we're, you know, this is something that we, that is a really important thing to do. Um, and we need to be more critical about the ways we are applying that. Uh, and, you know, for me, there were steps along that process. And when I started my studio in, in, in 2012, um, the Office for Creative Research, like for us, it was about not doing work that was um, that was about selling products, like because I don't think the world really needs to like sell too many more things. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, let's not do that type of work. But then later we we became sort of understanding that even then when we were doing work for a not for profit or you know some some governmental institution or even a museum, there are still questions about. Hey, what what are the stories that we're telling here, and how can we tell them in the most accurate possible way? Um, you know, Kim Reese said this to me. I don't know how many years ago, eleven years ago, or something. That one of the things that she likes to do when she starts a project is just to sit, spend time with one line in the data, right? Mm -hmm. And just make sure you know, like, what does each thing mean, and where did it come from, and and that that is um, important for us. Um, Hang on a second. I gotta. I gotta get that. Give me one second. <laughs> it's the beauty, beauty of having live events. My uh, partner is training for a marathon, and she just came back from a very long run. So, ah, of uh, course, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope that we sort of all understand that a little better than we maybe did ten years ago. But what, what I think our our it's a it is a responsibility for us because if not us, who, you know it. it we live in a we live in a magical place where we we do have the knowledge, we do have the access, and we do have the power, and so we have a we're in a good place to be able to to be critical, and I know this is a hard thing to sort of ask as of people, but to be able to put up your hand and say, hey, I think there's something here that that I don't feel comfortable with, and. Uh, because we know what we know what 15 years of not that looks like like 15 years of people making stuff and not being critical of what it is we know what that looks like mm -hmm. and so we need to we need to all be understanding that that this world is not being made by some unthinking artificial intelligence it's being made by us and and uh yeah, for me, for me, it's like, you know, I have a kid. I think I told you that. I'm not, I'm not excited about my kid it's living with data. You know, I'm not. It terrifies me. You know, the idea that he's six and I bet you he's in a, a facial recognition database somewhere. And, and, or that, or that his school is going to implement some AI, uh, you know, learning pr program that is going to be, you know, making either his life harder or, or, or again, more importantly, like other people who are already marginalized make their lives harder. And so, yeah, I don't, I think we, 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 you were, you were these, us data viz people, I don't want us to not, to stop having fun, right? Cause it's fun. Mm -hmm. The thing we do is fun and I still make data visualizations and I still enjoy it. I still stay up you know, late at night trying to fix some piece of code that will make it all work. And when it happens, I have this moment of joy and I want to preserve that. But I also feel like I get, yeah, we have a, it's on us. It's on us. And 
uh, yeah, that's that's. I'm going to eat a piece of cheese now. <laughs> uh, we have another question from our audience. This time, Paulo asks, "Do you think virtual reality or augmented reality could help with data exploration?" Oh yeah, hey Paulo, that's a great question. Yeah, I think totally. I mean, I, we've done, we, I've done some work in those areas. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to meet at a conference John Underkoffler a few years ago, who's a good friend of mine. He designed um, the Minority Report interface and also all of those Iron Man interfaces. And um, yeah, it goes back to something I was saying earlier about the um, trying to break ourselves out of out of restrictions about space. And I think John's imagination has always been about that, about like how do we bring data into spaces that are more human scaled? Uh, and he, you know, one of it, one of my favorite um, things that he always says is that we have the, the most amazing dexterous tools at the end of most of our arms. And um, we use them to go like this. <laughs> you know, it's like, we we uh, we we take a lot of expressivity that's available to us through interface away because of the way that the the mouse or the trackpad kind of gives us to 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 work with it. So I uh, I haven't done a lot of 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 either of those things specifically, although we've done sort of large scale gestural interfaces, which are very similar in some ways to both of those tools. The the biggest problem I have with all those things is accessibility. And you know, I, I don't think that we need to be inventing ways to keep data from people. And so uh, if the ways that we are telling data stories are less accessible than the screen, we need to be thinking about how to, how to make that easier. Um, so I think a lot about um, elderly people and how we block them out of data discussions because is often they don't even you know have easy access to the web. Um, so I love that work, but the people who are on the frontiers of that work need to be even more um, sort of questioning about the ways you facilitate um, our job in the last 10 years about considering accessibility and data visualization, but the ways that we design our color palettes and the ways that we kind of do things. but you know, if I'm asking someone to put on a VR headset, then I'm already excluding everybody who's blind or visually impaired. And so so uh, that that is a question you have to ask yourself. And I don't know that there's a straightforward answer for it, um, but keep it in your head. Great. Um, so going back to something that you mentioned already, that is uh, public. Um, so put the, the data visualizations into um, into the public sphere. Uh, how can we use this data visualization as a vehicle to start public discussions around this, uh, all these ethical and privacy concerns uh, about collecting and analyzing data? Can you say something about your experience on the projects that you already implemented? How can we increase the, this, the, the amount of uh, these interventions? Yeah. yeah, and you know, I think that was always, uh, it was always the kind of goal when I started doing data visualization that I would, um, I would show these things and that it would you know, communicate outwards and people would, I, I actually remember, I think Manuel and I in, 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 in uh, I don't know how, this was a long time ago, 2009 probably, we're even starting to think about how could data visualize visors help with education around climate change. And, um, and what I what I think I realized since then is that you, there are ways, there are inroads we can make by making better graphics and kind of telling a better story, especially towards policymakers. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if your if your intent is to change the mind of a politician then making a good graphic and getting it in front of them is something that can actually drive change. And we've seen this, you know, co Congress people kind of holding up graphics and being like, this is, that always makes me excited. I'm like, okay, this is, this is a place where data visualization can kind of really work. But if we want to do the other one and we want to change public opinion, here's, here's something you might not know about people. Graphs are not interesting for them. 
Like, I know it's hard for us to take because we're data people and we love graphs. But for the average person, I know, and again, they don't like them. They don't, they're not like we can do our best to make them readable. We can do our best to like, this engaging. Thing that you said. For the average person, like a yeah, graph is about as exciting as like a cold piece of toast, you know? And so <laughs> they're like handing people a cold piece of toast and saying, like, can you like be engaged with this? And I think um I think what we need to understand is we've got to do better. And so that means uh, you know, we we've, we've been experimenting with data sculpture and performance, just just like putting data in public space as big posters or whatever it is, like kind of disarming people, pushing pushing them in ways um, uh, uh, that that are that are going to be engaging. Like, let's get a little crazy with it, is what I'm saying. Um, so far, you've you've done plenty of things. You've turned data into sound. You worked with text and numbers quite a lot. You placed a big heart in the middle of Times Square. Is there anything you'd like to do that you haven't done yet or something that you still need to accomplish? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I don't question. know. I don't know. I like I, one of the things that's been fun about the work that I've done is that as sort of every time I do something, it brings in opportunities that I wouldn't have expected. Um, I uh, I had the chance in 2013, I think, to to ride in the submarine that discovered the Titanic down to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And if you had asked me in 2012 what my goals were, I would not have said that because I would have had no idea to sort of understand that. So I guess you know a better way of saying that is that I just hope that like there continue to be surprises for me as to the type of work that I'm doing, um, and. Yeah, it, it, more and more I'm interested in in doing work that that has uh, you know direct and measurable outcomes with communities, and so that that the, with the veal kit stuff, we're really trying to understand how that works. Um, somebody just asked a question uh, uh, about about harm and how and how we you know as, as analysts or data people how we might explore the kind of risks of harm. And that's another thing that I that I'm particularly interested in uh, is how do I how do I go about work with a clear understanding of the types of harms that might be possible? I, I don't have a great specific answer to your question, except you know I write about this in the book about the Signal Code, which was published by Nathaniel Raymond and his group about humanitarian work, which is a lot of the kind of work that I've been doing encompasses. So that Signal Code, um, uh, which I think I can post a link in the. Well, I'll put it in the private chat and then you guys can um, post the link. Uh, uh, that signal code is like a good example. And I would love to see something like that that's written a little bit more more towards data people. Uh, and then and then on the other extreme, sort of more data E, uh, you know, there's a lot of work about algorithmic audits that are happening right now. So the Canadian government, for example, any any piece of software that gets deployed by the government that involves an algorithm needs to go through an algorithmic auditing process that asks questions about risk and bias. And so I think um, this stuff can sound tedious, like who wants to do that when they start a project, but um, it is something we need to think about because we know that tools can be built with all good intention that can end up causing real and direct harms to, to certain groups of people. Um, and and then maybe the last thing I'll add to that is that what here hey here's one way you can you can mitigate that is by making sure that you have a diverse group of people building your tool. This is one of the things I can't see is the is like futures that I don't inhabit. So as a sort of straight white American, it's very hard for me to imagine a lot of futures. But if I am working with a team that involves transgender people or involves uh, um, you know, insert insert at risk groups here as far as technology is concerned. I'm automatically going to do a better job because these are people who can inhabit and will inhabit those futures, and will be able to answer those questions in a better way. Okay. Um, so um, 
if you touched already the the map room project that I love and uh, if I wanted to replicate it in here in Lisbon uh, what what actually I need uh, yeah. just a place uh, to, yeah. to set the, oh, that's the a map good question. how can so I, I yeah, involve I, um, people yeah. yeah all the process make make it work and if you so, want to uh, ex ex explain a bit yeah. more the I, I sort of jumped in 2000 and in the in the end of 2017 2018 right into writing this book and the map room has actually been mostly under the stewardship of um yanni lucasis who you, who you should definitely have for one of these conversations he wrote a great book called all data are local um and so yanni would i would reach out to yanni is what i would do <laughs> <and see. laughs> okay but, good point <laughs> and, you know, that's always been one of our one of our, uh, our goals with that project is to kind of build some some open source sort of software that you can use to get that thing working in your own community. Um, but with all that said, it's it's an idea and not a, and not a piece of technology. So mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I'm we're all, myself and Yanni are always open for people to kind of take that idea and run with it. And so I know that Lisbon is bustling with 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 and uh, uh, techie people. So. You know, I think what's fun about that is that you could start with the idea of the map room. And I bet as you all sit around the table eating your um, delicious food together, you'll come up with a different idea and it'll become something um, it becomes something, it becomes something new that's, you know, I, that's situated where you are, which I, which is I, I love more than anything else. OK, thanks for the advice. <laughs> Now that you, uh, we are uh, approaching uh, the end, I'd like to ask you, um, you end your book with this idea that um, the promise of data is adrift and that yeah. we need to catch it. That's the very end of the book. As utopic as it might sound, could you describe what we would live, what our lives would look like right now if in the past 15, 20 years, we treated data as the living thing that yeah. it is. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. What a way to what a, what a thing to imagine. You know, I write in the book that um, I write in the book about this tool that was built in the basement of MIT in the late 1970s. It was called Data Land, and it was a data exploration interface. And those types of projects that were happening there and in Stanford and in, in other sort of garages in the Pacific Northwest really defined the ways that we we live in technology and the, and, our, and the ways that we think about how it might be used. And with this particular project, one of the things that I was super taken by was that it was obviously, obviously influenced by Star Trek. <laughs> and yeah, you know, you would sit in this command chair, and there was a big screen, and you would use your interface. And the the whole metaphor of it was that you were like in a spaceship, looking down on the the place the data was coming from, and you, as the like technologically sophisticated person, were were kind of making, changing things and 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 understanding. And I think we still live in that world, particularly. People, I think all of us, you know, we don't, we tend to be above and looking down. And so when I was writing that, I was thinking about, okay, well, like, what, what would be another television show that at the time those people might have taken their, their cues from? And as a, as a thought experiment, I thought about Sesame Street. Like, what if, what if these people were like, let's build the data thing that's all about Sesame Street and like how different that would have been because it would have necessarily involved talking to people. It would have necessarily involved like kind of being social and, and playful and uh, like considering one of the things Sesame Street really would, does well. And the reason why it succeeds is it, it treats human uh, kids as adults. It treats them as with a tremendous amount of respect. And I think, uh, we don't do that with the subjects of the data that we work with. We don't often sort of treat them with respect. I can't, I can't paint that exact picture, but I, I think we could have totally gone down a different road had, had people like fastened on to different metaphors. And so now we need to do that work and it's harder now than it was going to be then. And we need to be making things that are radical. We need to be making things that um, embody the futures that we, and I mean you and I, and our parents and our grandparents and our children and their children want to inhabit. 
Because if we don't start doing that work, no one's going to do it for us. And no one's going to do it for us. <laughs> yeah, the Jeff Bezos is not going to do it for us. And, and uh, it's not going to happen. We're, we're, yeah. we're gonna, it's going to get worse. Yeah. And, and, and the only way that it gets better is by um, day to day, making small steps, building small bridges, building communities of people who believe in a better information future uh, and making choices that that are the right ones that feel like they're in service of a better of a better place and um <clears throat> you know i know that these these sentiments maybe don't ring true with everybody and that's fine but i think they ring true with a lot of people and for those people uh we need yeah we need to start waking up and and every day just thinking about what are the things we can do like said, events like this ones to spread yes. the word. Yes. <laughs> okay, so it's our time to end up this meetup, unfortunately, but it was lovely to have you, Ger. Um, and we have some more questions in the in the sh in, in the comments. If you have time to answer them later on on the YouTube, you. Um, would be great uh for now uh we will invite you to come to lisbon and have proper sardines like grilled ones i love those uh, oh. <laughs> exactly uh, so it would be really nice to have you here uh, in the upcoming future so thank you so much thank you for your time i know that now you are very busy with the, all the talks and all the the events so thank you so much Hey, thank you. This is great. Uh, cheers. And yeah, we will definitely, <laughs> we will definitely next time we meet, it will be in a, uh, a sidewalk somewhere and we'll be uh, enjoying in these this. hills in, yeah. somewhere in the city. Super. Sounds great. Thank right, you thank so you. much. Thank you. So it's time for us to tell you about all the next steps on our meetup. Um, so first, thank you so much for being here. And now let's announce the next event. It will be on the 18th of November uh, with Jane Adams, an awesome uh, data visualization artist as well. Um, yeah, so just uh, plan ahead. Put it on your calendar. We'll be announcing uh, it soon, giving your uh, giving you more details. Stay tuned. <laughs> and we are very excited to announce that we have a newsletter for the past few months. We've been working on this project in secret, uh, but now you can become one of our subscribers and get access to extra database content. We'll have exclusive interviews, sneak peeks and suggestions, and we called it Pastel de Data. What <laughs> an amazing name. name. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> awesome name. Uh, it was Renata's husband's idea because we all love Portugal data and pastries in equal amount. <laughs> you can register for the Portuguese or the English version and start getting pastel data on your mailbox in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll put the link in the comments if you want to subscribe right away. Okay. Um, next one, please. Can you put the next one? Sorry, Salome. I'm here having some. Okay, so uh, just let you know about this awesome event that uh, will happen soon, early November. Um, there is a mistake there, so it's from 12 to 14. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it's an awesome event. If you like hackathons, if you like to work uh, with data, go. It's about sustainable cities. Awesome uh, topic. Uh, so feel free to check their website and participate. Uh, so I guess see you uh, all in November, uh, in 18th of November. Don't forget. And thank you for being here today. So bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.